What I'd like to do this morning is give you a 49-year perspective on telemedicine and also a perspective on some of the other major problems that exist in our healthcare delivery system in which I feel other types of technologies will be equally as important as we think telemedicine is today. I need to actually take you back almost to the day, 49 years ago, when I was a senior resident um, at the Massachusetts General Hospital. And 49 years ago, they didn't have a medical specialty called the emergency medical specialty. The people who ran the emergency departments were the senior residents in surgery and the senior residents in medicine. And we took Q 12-hour shifts. And this particular late summer day in 1967, I was out front of the ER at the Mass General. And all of a sudden, the ER doors swung open. And of course, I expected another classic Boston traffic accident victim to be wheeled in. But no, standing in the middle of those doors was my professor of medicine, Dr. Kenneth Bird, who to me is the father of telemedicine. And Dr. Bird was sweating. His face was red. Clearly, he was upset. And I knew exactly why. Dr. Bird had just come from his moonlighting job as the medical director at Logan Airport Medical Station. Now, why was Dr. Bird moonlighting? Well, as a professor of medicine at Harvard Medical School in 1967, he was making a grand total of $8,000 a year. And just about every professor, while they were doing their research on one side, were doing clinical practice taking another job, and he was medical director at Logan Airport Medical Station. Anybody who's ever been to Boston knows that the Mass General Hospital is only three and a half miles away from Logan Airport. The only problem is that in 1967, there was only a single tunnel under the Charles River, which you had to go through to get to Logan Airport or back to the Mass General. That tunnel was the Sumner Tunnel. There was no Callahan Tunnel. There was no Ted Williams Tunnel. Just the Sumner Tunnel. And there were miles and miles of cars lining up to go through that Sumner Tunnel. And every day, it took Dr. Bird to go three and a half miles an hour each way. And this particular summer day, he got caught in the middle of the tunnel. He sat there for about 45 minutes, finally got to the hospital, and had this appearance as I watched him come storming through the ER doors. And I was the first person he saw. And he came running up to me, and he grabbed my arm. And before he had a chance to say anything, I said, I know, Dr. Bird. I know you got caught in the tunnel again. He said, yes. He said, but I have this idea. What do you think about it? He said, what if I buy two television cameras, and I put one at Logan Airport Medical Station, and I put one here at the MGH ER, and I started to examine patients over television? What do you think? Now, you have to understand, I was a resident. He was my professor. I thought it was the stupidest idea I'd ever heard of in my life. But I had enough common sense to say, gee, Dr. Bird, that's a very interesting idea. Late summer, 1967. By the fall of 1967, he had purchased two television cameras. And don't forget, 1967, there was no color. It was all black and white. And we set it up in the Mass General ER I remember the day I took a bone marrow specimen out to Logan Airport, where our chief of pathology, Benjamin Castleman, read that bone marrow from the Mass General ER 
using the TV cameras. Now, you might be asking, how could he read it? Since we just had the grayscale, well, fascinatingly, it was amazing how quickly the faculty adapted to the grayscale, and the dermatologist could tell whether it was a erythematous lesion simply by the intensity of the grayness. And within a few years, we had a fully functional telemedicine system working between Logan Airport and the Mass General Hospital. Every single clinical faculty division chief used that system except for one. And that was Dr. Tom Dwyer. There's a specific reason I'm bringing this out. And what was Dr. Dwyer the chief of? He was head of psychiatry. And he said to Ken Bird, I remember it exactly, I was standing there. He said, Ken, look, this cold mechanistic technology will never ever work in psychiatry. It will never ever be able to reproduce that special ambience that exists between the psychiatrist and his or her patient in the room together. Now, as you can imagine, Ken Bird was a maverick. And by the way, the word telemedicine, when the two TV cameras were put in, he looked at me and he said, Jay, we can't call this television medicine. Let's call it telemedicine. That, to me, was the origin of the word telemedicine. So Dr. Bird, being a maverick, he challenged Tom Dwyer. And he said, Tom, I think you're wrong. He bought another TV camera. He went to the medical director, John Knowles, got some additional dollars, and put a, another TV camera out at the Bedford VA Hospital where the psychiatry faculty, the MGH, used to travel every day to see their patients. Three years after the introduction of this, Dr. Dwyer and his entire faculty wrote a series of articles on the incredible effectiveness of telepsychiatry. And what he found out was something he never, ever imagined, and something we don't do enough of today with the camera technology that we have. He found out that he not only could reproduce that special ambience, that special environment between the doctor and the patient, even though they were at a distance, but more importantly, he could manipulate the environment. What he found was something that if you ask a TV director or movie director, they'll say, well, sure. The way we create the emotions of a scene is not simply by the dialogue and not simply by the facial expressions of the actors, but the way we shoot the scene. And what Tom Dwyer found out was that when he was talking to a patient, at the Bedford VA Hospital from the Mass General Hospital, and he really wanted that patient to think about what he just told him. He wanted him to chew on it and synthesize it. He would start to pan the camera in on his face. So as the patient is watching him, his body is getting smaller, his face is getting larger and larger and larger to the patient. To the patient, it seemed like, oh my goodness, this message is coming from a much higher authority. <laughs> and when he felt the patient wasn't ready to deal with the emotions of that particular time, and he wanted to dilute the intensity of it, he miniaturized himself by backing off from the camera. And as you know better than I today, after teleradiology, the most frequent use of telemedicine is in the mental health care space. And we have actually found through very good studies that have been done that the patient actually gives a much more complete history over telemedicine than they do in the room with the psychiatrist. That's the way I was introduced 
to telemedicine 49 years ago, and we're still talking 49 years later about introducing this as something new. In 1973, when I was chief of medicine at the University of Miami, I got my first grant in telemedicine from the National Science Foundation. It was actually in two, I wanted to do it to rural communities, but at the time, I don't know how many of you remember, there were the Attica riots around the United States, um, the prison riots, and Attica was a major one, and the National Science Foundation wanted to do something about it. One of the major concerns that um, inmates had related to the issue of healthcare access. So we developed a telemedicine system for correctional health care in 1973, and we, uh, I started the first nurse practitioner program in the state of Florida, and we used nurse practitioners with telemedicine versus board-certified internists who were physically on site. And as you might anticipate, after three years, our study showed that nurse practitioners with telemedicine were as good as board-certified physicians physically on site. And in a few areas, better. 1976, when I completed the telemedicine grant, I was asked by a number of reporters, and this is a warning to you, I was asked by a number of reporters when I thought telemedicine would be an integral part of our telemedicine program throughout the United States. And I said, oh, minimum of five, 10 years. My warning, don't believe any predictions I make to you. <laughs> 1976, when we completed the study, I got an invitation from the Shah of Iran. I went to Iran, he wanted telemedicine. I don't know how many of you know this, from a historical standpoint, but the Shah of Iran was a huge electronic gadgeteer. He had the latest electronics. His people were dying of starvation and infectious diarrhea from unsanitary water, but he had the latest US jets. And interestingly, and they've never taught this to us in the history books, you know who was servicing all of his U.S. jets? Israel. And in return, the Shah was giving Israel oil. Now, I very politely said to the Shah, you know, I think this is a wonderful initiative that you want. But I said, you know, your people are not dying because they can't see a cardiologist or a neurologist or a psychiatrist. They're dying of starvation. They're dying of unsanitary water and infectious diarrhea. Why don't you initially spend your money on that? Same year, I got an invitation from President and Mrs. Marcos. I spent a week with them in the Philippines. And Mrs. Marcos was the major power at the time. She was the mayor of Metro Manila. And as you know, the Philippines is an archipelago of 7,000 islands, but everything is in Metro Manila. But she wanted to bring health care out to the out islands, which once again was a, a great thought. But once again, they weren't dying because they couldn't see a cardiologist or a psychiatrist. They were dying of starvation and infectious diarrhea. So, from 1976 to 1991, the person I most frequently spoke to about telemedicine was myself. I couldn't get anybody interested in telemedicine until October of 1991 when I got a call from the governor of Georgia, Governor Zell Miller, who said, Dr. Sanders, I would like you to come up to Georgia and develop a statewide telemedicine program. I went up there. He introduced himself to me. He said, Dr. Sanders, I am the governor of two states, 
And I looked at him somewhat quizzically, and he said, yes, I'm the governor of Atlanta, and I'm the governor of the rest of Georgia. <laughs> he said, we have everything we need here in Atlanta, but the rest of Georgia is dying, literally and figuratively. He said, and this is not just an issue of health care. He said, this is an issue of economics. And he taught me Economics 101, which I never learned in medical school. He said, Jay, who do you think the biggest employer in our rural towns are? He said, every rural town that has a hospital, the biggest employer in town is that hospital. OK? But 10 to 12 rural hospitals per month in the United States at that time were going under. They were closing their doors. And why were they closing their doors? Because their medical staff was made up of general practitioners, good general practitioners, family practitioners, an occasional internist, a general surgeon, maybe a circuit riding radiologist. If you came in with a cardiological or neurological problem, you were immediately transferred to an urban medical center. As their bed census went down, because they didn't have the medical staff and the expertise, and they, they, the community dynamics couldn't support a cardiologist, couldn't support a neurologist. They transferred these patients, their bed census went down, the hospital closed, and within a three to five year period of time, the entire socioeconomics of that community went under. He wanted telemedicine to bring health care and to bring jobs to Georgia. That's where we're going to begin, but before we do, I'd like to show you how really old telemedicine is and how far behind we are. Take a look in the upper right-hand corner at the date. April 1924. This is a picture that appeared on the front cover of this magazine called Radio News. It was published in London. This is the US edition. By the way, this magazine still exists. It just changed its name to Popular Mechanic. And what do you see? You see a young boy sitting on the edge of his bed at home, being examined by his pediatrician who is at his office. And what is the technology they're using? 1924. There was only one technology. It was a radio. So who in the world thought of TV. Are any of you in here uh, science fiction buffs? Do you know the Emmy Awards? You know the Oscar Awards? Have you ever heard of the Hugo Awards? The Hugo Awards are given out every year for the best science fiction writing. Look at the editor of the radio news. The H stands for Hugo. This idea was that of Hugo Gernsbach. TV was not invented, folks, in 1924. <laughs> he thought of that as well. So those of us who think we're pioneering, forget it. <laughs> he even thought of haptics. Now, I don't know how many of you know what haptics is, but it gives me the ability here to literally examine you wherever you are, to touch you, to feel your skin, to feel a macular papular rash. Okay? These were haptics. So he could he thought of the idea of being able to examine someone at a distance, and we're still today perfecting that technology. Okay, telemedicine. As I mentioned to you from my standpoint, the person who invented the word 
was Ken Bird because he was using a television camera. As you know, there are companies today who say they're telemedicine companies, and they predominantly use a telephone. I won't mention their name. Well, folks, before the television camera was introduced, all of us professionally were talking to our patients in the middle of the night and saying, take two aspirin and I'll see you in the morning on a phone. We never called it telemedicine then. And today, of course, we have this word telemedicine. We also have the term telehealth. We have mHealth, eHealth, and so forth and so on. Quite candidly, despite the fact I started the American Telemedicine Association, we need to get rid of the term. It's medicine. That's all it is. You know, I, I don't know why we're, we're making something of this. We always use telecommunications. We now have the virtue of just having dramatic improvement in telecommunications technology. Telecommunications to me is the umbilical cord for telemedicine, for remote healthcare delivery. From my standpoint, I wish we got rid of the term. Okay, we're gonna go through four basic things, only one of which has to do with telemedicine, and you'll understand why in a moment. We must bring the examination room to the patient. Well, this is our circa 1991 telemedicine system in the state of Georgia, asked for by Governor Zell Miller. We set up 59 sites in a year and a half period of time. Three academic medical centers connected to nine comprehensive community hospitals, each of those in turn connected to rural hospitals, public schools, nursing homes, and freestanding ambulatory clinics in the state. And it was totally connected. So that if one site went down, one of the academic medical centers went down, they could access any of the other medical centers. It was a totally interconnected system. And that became the model for the state of Arizona. They brought their legislatures. They brought their academic uh, dean uh, to Georgia. And they took this system. Then the state of California came. UC Davis predominantly utilized the same system. And that became the model for literally every state program today. Now. I want to point out something that everybody doesn't talk about, which to me is one of the greatest strengths of telemedicine. OK, so first we have, we have a cardiologist here at the Medical College of Georgia listening to the heart and lung sounds of a patient in Eastman, Georgia, which is 130 miles away from the Medical College of Georgia in Augusta. But it doesn't really matter whether it's 130 miles, 1,300 miles, 13,000 miles. It does matter if we're going to Mars. And I'll talk about that in a little bit and some of the work that I've done with NASA for deep space flight. So we have this cardiologist listening to that heart and lung sounds. And we have the primary care physician at the rural hospital listening to that patient's heart and lung sounds at the same time the specialist is listening to the heart and lung sounds. Now, we immediately focus on, gee, isn't this great for the patient? Absolutely, it's great for the patient. The patient doesn't have to travel. But what no one seems to point out and what some studies have been done to prove it is that it's also great for that primary care physician. That interaction between the specialist and the primary care physician basically brings that primary care physician back to when they were in training with their attending there with them. And what we found in those 1973 to 76 uh, NSF grants 
I'll give you a specific example. There was a nurse practitioner off the coast of Maine in a, an island called Farmington. And she was connected to the Dartmouth-Hitchcock Dermatology Clinic because she saw a lot of dermatologic problems on the island that she didn't know what to do with, and they would have to be transported by boat uh, to the mainland to be seen. And after about the 13th month of use, as we were looking at the utilization of her consultations, we noticed that while it, it rose dramatically during the first year, it started to level off and started to go down. And the question was, what was wrong with the telemedicine system? So we went out to visit her, and we said, are you having a problem with the telemedicine system? She said, oh, no, no, it's great. So we said, well, why aren't you using it as much as you used to? She said, oh, I don't need to. I now know what that macular papular rash is. I don't need the consultant. One of the great advantages to me of telemedicine is not simply bringing access to care to the patient, it's bringing access to continuing medical education for that rural-based physician. In an ideal world, after you put a telemedicine system in, after a period of time, it, also, it ought to self-destruct because your physicians in your rural communities now know how to deal with that particular problem. In 1993, which is the year I started the American Telemedicine Association, I got a grant from the federal government for a million dollars. In 1993, that was a lot of money. And why did I get the grant? Because I said, you know what? There's something wrong here. Yes, I can now bring my neurologist to that rural hospital ER. Yes, I can now bring my cardiologist to take care of the patient in florid pulmonary edema in that rural hospital. But what if I had seen that patient, you know, five, six, seven days before they ended up in extremis in that hospital ER? What if I could have seen them in their home and identified the fact they were starting to go downhill and with a little extra diuretic or a little extra prednisone for the asthmatic, I could have avoided that hospital admission. So I put in a grant and got this million dollars from the federal government to develop the first technology to go into the home. This was 1993. We called it, as you heard, the electronic house call. And interestingly enough, what I wanted to do was not put in a whole bunch of sophisticated technology in the patient's home, we might be able to use it, but they're never going to learn to use it. I wanted to use the most intuitive technology to the patient. And I took a clue from Hugo Gernsbach. What was the most, what was the entertainment device in 1924? It was the radio. What was the entertainment device in 1993 and still is today? The TV. I got a call one day from the local cable company, Jones Intercable. They no longer, they were bought up. But Jones Intercable said, Dr. Sanders, we would like to help you develop this electronic house call. And by the way, I really needed their help. Why? Because in 1993, there was no fiber <laughs> in the ground. It was coaxial cable. How in the world was I going to make this two-way interactive? And they said, we can make it two-way interactive. I said, how do you do that with coaxial cable? They said, if we take, it through an e take the signal through an ethernet, ethernet bridge and add a reverse amplifier, we can do it. And they did. We went to the hospital CEO and we said, who are your most revolving door chronic disease patients? We identified 25 patients. We put this system in their home. We started to, we had a graphical interface on their TV. So if I wanted to listen to their heart sounds, there was a stethoscope that appeared on their TV. All they had to do was touch it. That activated our system. And then the voila moment occurred. 
we had technologically been able to e examine these patients at home. And as soon as we did that, as soon as we started to see these patients in their home, everything changed from a medical perspective. We found out that it was not simply that we could see them in their home, we had to see them in their home. The exam room has to be where the patient is, not where the doctor works. Why? Let me give you an example. Mrs. Jones, this was a patient who was constantly being readmitted to the hospital ER in status asthmaticus just about every six weeks, particularly during the winter months. We would send her out with almost normal pulmonary functions, high dose steroids, all of the anti leukotrienes et cetera, et cetera, and she ended up coming back. We saw her in her home, and we noticed as we were examining her, she was sitting in this great big, she was sitting in this great big puffy chair. She had a thick rug on her floor. She had very thick curtains on her window. She's giving us her history as she's petting her cat. <laughs> and her husband is watching this dramatic medical experiment at the kitchen door with a cigarette in his mouth. <sighs> All the lights went off. He said, my God, we send her home to a toxic environment. She doesn't need more corticosteroids. She needs an interior decorator and a divorce lawyer. <laughs> Under a NASA grant in 98, we developed the first healthcare kiosk. We wanted to do, and you know, we get all excited. We think we're doing something new. Ladies and gentlemen, we are so far behind every other service industry that exists that it is really criminal. What do I mean by that? How do we get our entertainment today? Our entertainment is brought to us. Everybody here, I assume, has Netflix. Has anybody ever been on Amazon? Our commerce is brought to us. How many of you use online banking? I'm not asking for a show of hands. Every service industry brings their services to us, except the biggest service industry, healthcare. We are taking baby steps right now. If we want to call it telemedicine, whatever we want to call it, we are now catching up with every other service industry. We're not eliminating the rest of it. You still go to the movies, but you also get your Netflix that are brought to you. You're still going to go to the doctor, but part of the process to eliminate access issues, cost issues, not necessarily quality issues, because I'm going to get into that, by using telecommunications technology. That's all it is. And we can use really sophisticated devices. We can use an autonomous robot. We can use a kiosk, a much better kiosk than the one I built under NASA. We can use an iPad. We can use a computer. We can use a TV. We can use a smartphone. I'm going to get into this a little bit more, but I want to point out, using all of this, we better make sure this doesn't happen. <laughs> so far, it hasn't. <laughs> OK. Now I'm going to say something that's going to upset you. And it's particularly going to upset my colleagues. But it's the reality.
Approximately two months ago, an article came out in the British Medical Journal, authored by Johns Hopkins professor, that stated that the third leading cause of death in the United States, medical errors. The third leading cause of death in the United States is medical errors. Ladies and gentlemen, there is not a single physician in this room who is up to date. Not a single one of us. And while you may think that's a criticism, to me, I'm really applauding that. Why? Because we have been so good at the bedside, individually, and at the research bench. We have accumulated so much information, new information, critical information, that not a single one of us can keep up to date. And that's the problem. What is never talked about in terms of telemedicine or any of the other technologies or any of the other analytical engines that are out there is what if you're analyzing garbage? What if the information in this wonderful EHR that's now digitized and can be sent X, Y, and Z places is wrong? What if you have this wonderful statewide telemedicine program that is transporting all this information to all these locations that have no access to care and the consultative information is wrong? Nobody ever talks about the quality and content of the information. We all assume somewhat naively that, oh, well, telemed telemedicine is going to dramatically improve care because I'm taking this specialist and bringing that specialist to the patient. What if the specialist is out of date? Now I'm underlining and really making a point at one end of the pendulum. But when you have studies that show that one third the third leading cause of death in the United States is medical errors. We need to be thinking about that because telemedicine could be dangerous to your health. So what do we do? I'm going to prove to you all right now with a show of hands. I'm going to three, ask you three very quick questions. How many of you have ever had a physical exam? Just raise your hand. I hope all of you have your hands up. OK, keep your hands up. Keep your hands up. Second question. How many of you, when you had your physical exam, had your doctor listen to your heart and lung sounds? Great. Last question, I promise. How many of you, before your doctor listened to your heart and lung sounds, asked your doctor when he or she had their last hearing test? How in the world do you know those people who are told their heart is normal should be worrying the most? Because the doctor who said, oh, I hear something abnormal, I'm going to send you for subsequent tests, that's OK. But those of you who told, oh, if the heart's perfectly normal, you have no slightest idea whether that doctor heard your murmur or not. You know, 30 years ago, if you had the softest diastolic rumble I could hear that. Today, it better be grade six. <laughs> this is the reality. But I'm not pointing a finger at us. I'm applauding the fact that we have so much information that we now can't keep up. So what are we going to do? Well, in 1969, prodded by another professor of mine, I started doing artificial intelligence. And I thought it was the most ridiculous thing in the world until I started doing it. And then I quickly learned we didn't have enough computer power to do it. Then in the 80s, MIT started, became a big center for AI. And they also found out, after a few years, they didn't have the computer capability. Today, we have the computer capability to bring the collective physician 
to the bedside. And one of the things I would ask you all to think about as you're putting in your telemedicine systems is getting involved in artificial intelligence. Do you know what IBM's Watson is doing now? IBM's Watson is finishing medical school at Cleveland Clinic. IBM's Watson is now reading x-rays at the University of Maryland with the vice chairman of the Department of Radiology, Elliot Siegel, who, by the way, was one of the author of DICOM standards. And Watson is now being used by MD Anderson and Sloan Kettering to provide oncologic consultations on the web to any oncologist worldwide who wants to input their patient's history, physical exam, lab data, x-rays, pathology, chemotherapeutic protocols that they have been on, asking Watson whether they've made the right diagnosis, using the right medication, are there any new trials, et cetera, et cetera. Watson represents our collective wisdom. And we need to start thinking very seriously about artificial intelligence at the bedside. Now our independent robot has AI going to the bedside. OK, third issue. I'm going to make a specific point. We have not the slightest idea when you get sick. You come into my office, with a blood pressure of 150 over 100. And I say to you, oh, you're hypertensive. Guess what? That's ridiculous. If I ask any physician in the room what the upper limit of normal blood pressure would be, even ask anybody who's a non-physician, you'd all know it's 120 over 80. And between 139 over 89, you're pre-hypertensive. And once you go above that, you're hypertensive. Ladies and gentlemen, that's ridiculous. Yes, we learned that in medical school. We learned that during our residency. We all accept that, and it's all wrong. Most of the women in this room have a lower blood pressure than most men in this room. That's why, by the way, you guys live longer than we do. I'm going to use my wife as an example. She hates me to do it. I have a feeling that there's a reason I do it. Her blood pressure is 90 over 60. How she has a blood pressure 90 over 60 living with me, I have not the slightest idea. But. So when she goes to her internist next year to have her annual physical exam, and it, blood pressure is 95 over 65, what do you think her internist tells her? Oh, Mrs. Sanders, your blood pressure is perfectly normal. And then the following year, it's 100 over 70. And then it's 110 over 75. And then it's 120 over 80. What do you think for the last five years my wife's internist has told her? Mrs. Sanders, your blood pressure is normal. And for the last five years, my wife's internist has been absolutely wrong. She's been hypertensive for the last five years. Her normal blood pressure is 90 over 60. Her sheer pressure in her vascular endothelium, her DP over DT, pressure change over time, is normal at 90 over 60, not at 110 over 75. She should have been treated when she started going up above 90 over 60. We have these normative values that we use, which are absolutely ridiculous, because they represent a statistical norm of millions of people that has nothing to do with you. Let me give you another classic example. If you came into my office today with a fasting blood glucose above 125, what would I be caused to do? I'd be caused to tell you, oh, I'm sorry, but 
you're diabetic. Do you know how many years <clears throat> before you got above 125 as your fasting blood glucose, I could have shown you that you were insulin resistant? 10 to 13 years. I should have been treating you for 10 to 13 years before this fasting glucose above 125. We have gotten caught up in, quotes, normative values which have nothing to do with you and me individually. I'm not talking about precision medicine from the NIH. I'm talking about day-to-day -day bread and butter medical care. How are we going to combat that? By the way, this is real. Do you realize that when you sit in your seat in your car, I've got your weight. When you put your hands on the steering wheel, I've got your pulse and rhythm strap. When you take your seat belt and you plug it in, I've got your respiratory rate, your respiratory volume, and with some neat signaling processing, I've got your mean arterial blood pressure. Why in the world don't we have a medical dashboard in every car? I mean, they need one in Washington. We have the stupidest drivers in the world. Can you imagine somebody cutting you off and you're going to get them for doing that? You know, and you start putting your foot on the accelerator and you're turning to swerve and you watch you develop a PVC or two, and your blood pressure starts going up, and your pulse is now above 100, what will happen? You will get off of that pedal. And if you have OnStar and it goes to your Cigna insurance, <laughs> I couldn't help. Couldn't help it. They're going to raise your, they're going to raise your, in, Health insurance and your car insurer is going to raise your car insurance. Watch what behavioral feedback that will provide. But now you know with all the millennials today, everybody is wearing some type of sensor. Now it's predominantly for the millennials and it's for, quotes, the healthy exercise population. By the way, this was the Viva Metrics Life Shirt, developed under DOD and Special Forces um, many years ago, this measures 42 physiological parameters wirelessly. And it was great technology. They were just poor business people, and they ran out of money. MIT. This tattoo depending upon the light wave you shine on it, will give you all your electrolytes. Five years from now, 10 years from now, and don't forget what I told you about my inability to predict anything. If you go into a doctor's office and a nurse comes at you to draw blood for your lab studies, run. because it's all going to be here. They're going to just shine a, a Raman spectroscopy light wave on your tattoo, which interrogates your interstitial fluid with microneedles that are totally painless. You'll have all of your blood electrolytes. This is where the technology is going, ladies and gentlemen. And now, the FCC, I know you're going to be talking about USAC. I actually um, got the then FCC commissioner, Reed Hunt, in 1996 after the Telecommunications Act to create the Rural Healthcare USAC Fund. Um, there is now specific spectrum that has been identified within the past year by the FCC for the body area network, which will control all of the body-worn sensors. And by the way, a little tidbit. Um, anybody know the person 
who a year before he died got a patent to collect physiological data from body-worn sensors into a smartphone? Steve Jobs. That's where Apple is going, folks. It's going to be a major focus of the Apple smartwatch, and Samsung is doing the same thing. What will be in that smartwatch is not only the ability to obtain all the information from all the body-worn sensors or, in fact, circulating sensors. I head up a medical advisory scientific board for the National Science Foundation of a center that is developing nanosensors. They'll be circulating sensors, less than seven microns, so they're smaller than a red blood cell, and they'll be circulating, and they'll be communicating with your smartwatch. And what else will be in that smartwatch? Watson, programmed for your individual vital signs. So when my wife's blood pressure goes up to 100 over 70, she will be alerted that she's now two standard deviations away from her normal blood pressure. Everybody knows what that is. There's got to be a bunch of Trekkies here in the. This is the tricorder. And this is the tricorder 1.0. Ladies and gentlemen, this device is my examination room as the physician. Ladies and gentlemen, this is your examining room as a patient. Let me just point out a few things. Holding my phone, thumb, and index finger, I get with a certain app, I have an EKG rhythm strip, a live core, OK? Number two, the camera. We're now using it. There is a microscope app that we're now using in Africa with villagers healthcare villagers who are taking blood from the natives, looking at it using their smartphone under a microscope to look for malarial parasites. As you may have seen in the last week, there is now an app with the camera and the light source that will give you your hematocrit. There is now an app for the camera that turns it into a spectroscope. You can go into a um, supermarket and shine this. It will tell you what's in the food you're buying. There is an app for the um, microphone turns it into a stethoscope. There is an app that you plug into the USB port, and at the other end is an ultrasound. And I can go around and scan anybody's carotids, heart, abdomen, right now with this device. For me, as the physician, it's my, what I call, my electronic black bag. I don't know how many people remember the doctor with the black bag. For you as a patient, it's your exam room. This is our biggest hurdle. And it was no better in evidence at the airport in Atlanta coming to Jackson. You know, ironically, worldwide, the two biggest problems, starvation, obesity. The major cause of liver disease in the United States, when I was a resident, 
When I was a younger physician, you know what the major cause of liver disease was? Alcohol. Not anymore. It is fatty infiltration of the liver. A major cause of cirrhosis, major cause of liver cancer after hepatitis C. Fascinating. Two ends of the spectrum. You know, you and I point fingers at our insurance company, our health insurance company. You and I point fingers at the federal government. You and I point fingers at our physicians for the fact that we're sick and that our health bills are going up. We never, ever point a finger in this direction. And unless we do something like that, I don't care about any of the other stuff that I talked about before this. We're not going to do anything with our health care delivery system in this country. You and I have got to start taking responsibility for our health. Our health is not caused by our physician. It's not caused by our health insurance company. It's not caused by our federal government. The majority of it is caused by us. Maybe this will work. This is a new mirror for us, the selfie generation. Maybe we'll start looking at what we look like. I'm going to end with The biggest problem we have, and that's resistance to change. And I'd like you to take a moment, read this. This is an exact quote that appeared in the London Times of 1834, put there by the most prestigious medical society in England, still today, the Royal Society of Medicine. And they put this in the London Times, and they were railing, criticizing this new technology that had been developed in 1819. This was 1834. What was the new technology? Anybody know what that is? It's the first stethoscope, the monocular stethoscope. It was developed by Dr. Lenneck a French physician who had a patient came, who came into his office in 1816. She was very shy. She had a problem. He took a history. He then said, Madam, I need to listen to your heart and lungs. And she said, Doctor, I would prefer you not. And he said, Madam, the only way I can find out what is going on with you is to listen to your heart and lungs. And once again, she being very shy, she said, please don't. Why? Because in those days, how did you listen to a patient's heart and lungs? You put your ear on the patient's chest. And in a moment, almost like Archimedes stepping in the tub and figuring out what floating meant, there was a magazine on his desk. He looked at the magazine, he took the magazine, and he rolled it up in a conical fashion. And he put the narrow end in his ear and the wide end on her chest, and he was almost like, voila. He could hear things now much better than if he had actually put his ear to the patient's chest, because the sounds were amplified. And from 1816 to 1819, he perfected the monocular stethoscope the symbol that every nurse and every doctor uses around their neck to identify themselves. I'm going to leave you with the last slide, a quote from Ralph Waldo Emerson. That's what you are doing today. Please keep it up. Thank you for listening. <laughs>